Hi, everyone. Welcome and very excited to have you as part of our town hall today. I'm Mike Allen and I serve AIM as their member engagement manager. Some of the work I do is on AIM social media, industry groups, and e-learning initiatives like this town hall today. Before we get started, there are a few items I would like to go over. Uh, first, you'll notice that you are muted, but we do want you to participate on this town hall. To participate at any time, you can send your questions by submitting them via the Q&A option that you can find at the bottom of your screen. We'll go over as many questions as we can and are always open to reaching out back to you after the town hall. I also briefly want to review the AIM antitrust and collaboration and work product policies. It is the policy of AIM Inc. to conduct its operation in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. AIM committee meetings are also held, or town halls like today, are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM's developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. Today, I'm here with two of AIM's key leaders, Chuck Evanho and Debs Mukherjee. Chuck is president and CEO of Aware Innovations and serves as AIM's chairman. Debs is the business development director at Cisc Semiconductor and is the regional leader for AIM North America. Chuck, if you'd like to start by giving a brief overview of AIM. Thank you, Mike. Um, for those of you that don't know, AIM has been around for nearly 50 years and we're an industry alliance that represents any organization, whether a manufacturer, user, uh, software developer, uh, systems integrator that is about using our technologies. When I say our technologies, we're talking about things like barcodes, RFID, and other technologies that advance automatic identification. We are essential uh, as a stakeholder group to enable the adoption, growth, and interoperability of these technologies and help the enterprises that are trying to use them effectively in their marketplace. Uh, as I said, we've been around for nearly 50 years, uh, founded initially to do standards, uh, but then uh, we've evolved into a broader stakeholder industry organization focused around not only standards, but education, such as this webinar, uh, advocacy, where we talk to uh, regional uh, governments and user organizations, as well as networking, uh, enabling others to learn from one another. We are an unbiased global alliance of over 300 organizations. You know, as I talked about, one of our founding drivers was standards. Now, if you recall, 50 years ago uh, was the implementation of the first uh, barcodes in, in everyday use for uh, scanning re products in the retail environment. But barcodes have been around before that, particularly in the industrial environment, warehouse environment. As such, we have multiple work, multiple efforts in different areas. We have a techno techno technical symbology committee which is responsible for the barcode specifications, standards, and quality guidelines. Almost every barcode in use today uh, in the international community uh, has come through the AIM Technical Symbology Committee. We also have our RFID Experts Group, which is responsible for guidance on RFID implementation, standards, as well as technical reports on how to use and best usage. Furthermore, AIM serves as what's known as an international registration authority for multiple standards. That means that AIM on a no cost basis helps uh, allocate, for example, uh, issuing agency codes so that people know uh, the data encoded in a, in a barcode or in an RFID tag. Also tangen tangential to this is our liaison relationships with many of the groups that either use or uh, implement uh, our technologies including things like blockchain and internet of things. Next slide. AIM is worldwide. Uh, we have chapters in Asia, China, Denmark, Europe, Germany, Japan, North America, Russia, and hopefully soon, uh, Korea. So we want to enable all the users, stakeholders in, this, in these areas to have take advantage of AIM and its resources. In that venue, we have multiple industry groups. Next slide, Mike. As I mentioned, we're very active in the Internet of Things, uh, RFID Experts Group, the Technical Symbology Committee, and Track and Trace. 
All these either have to do with the application of automatic identification technologies uh, or the standards around them. And AIM is proud to be the leader uh, in all of these areas. Toward that end, we do have a strong North American presence. Debs? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Chuck. So as Chuck mentioned, uh, AIM North America is an alliance uh, enabling cooperation, development, standardization of uh, AIDC technologies in the scope of North America. So we focus on different technologies and try incorporating blockchain and IoT as we are moving forward. We have different industry groups, four being really active at the moment. We've got cannabis that focuses on AIDC technology implementation and tracking and tracing of cannabis. This is a relatively new group that is looking into regulations at a state level and how we can work with the government agencies to bring more clarity in this scope. Food safety, where AIM North America members as well as uh, the work group members are focused in bringing end-to-end -end traceability to the entire food supply chain, thereby enhancing the safety in food supply chain. We've got the pharma group, which advocates use of AIDC technology to track uh, prescription drugs and to remove any kind of potentially dangerous uh, items out of uh, their pharmaceutical supply chain. And finally, UDI that focuses on implementation of the UDI standards and regulations. So we work with different peoples in the industry to make sure this information goes into the right pool. Uh, we work with partners, developers. We the, have initiatives such as webinars, such as this, where we are educating our members. We try to host panel discussions with experts in the industry where you can come up and discuss your thoughts and processes and what is the future of the industry that is really important uh, for our members. Uh, we host regular interviews, publish them on our journals, and one of the latest was to develop responses to FDA's call for comments. This was done by the food safety group in the context of the new policies which define food safety supply chain, so under Food Modernization Supply Chain Act. Next slide. Uh, this it gives us a good overview of AIM's uh, global leadership network. AIM North America is just one aspect of this huge network. What I really appreciate about AIM's uh, outreach programs are it is global, it is beyond boundaries. As a new member, when you join in, you have the opportunity not only to participate and make a difference at your regional level, but also go beyond borders and see what are your peers in different countries doing and have collaborations with them beyond the scope of your geographical regions. Next slide. Great, so Chuck and Debs, thank you again uh, for that uh, brief overview of AIM and AIM North America. Uh, we do wanna open this up to our audience here to ask questions, to learn a little bit more about AIM and our initiatives. So if you're ready, we can go ahead and get started with some of those questions that I've already received. Sure. All right, so this one I think is directed toward Chuck, uh, and it is how does a work item or project and aim get started? What is the process from start to finish? So, as I mentioned, AIM has been active in standards for nearly 50 years. So if there's an initiative or an application uh, involving our technologies, any of our stakeholders can bring forth uh, their, uh, their need, their idea, and work it through our, our work groups, whether it's in a North American work group, if it's North American centric or globally. And the work group has an, our experts, uh, volunteer experts, everybody's a volunteer within AIM, uh, collaborate to bring a solution to the market for that need. Uh, and again, it comes up through our work groups and as it's refined after uh, many reviews within the rope work group, it'll go out for public review. And then finally, uh, issued by AIM as either a report or a standard. Some of those standards then get put into the international community uh, through our liaisons with either SC31 or SC41 as appropriate, uh, meaning the barcode uh, RFID community, which is SC31, 
or SE41 is IoT, PC308 is blockchain. Great, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Debs, data capture has changed greatly over the years. How has and how is AIM adapting to the ever-changing world of data capture solutions? Uh, AIM has the best portfolio of people working with us. We have industry leaders that come up uh, with the ideas that how this industry should move forward. So they are pioneers. So they bring forward the generations. Uh, what, what are we expecting in our ne next generation? How are we moving out of legacy system and what kind of data capturing is in that process? So the experts in the community bring us the ideas. They work with us in different standardization organizations, some of which Chuck mentioned earlier, and they work through the development of the standardization, followed by an advocacy and adoption process. One of the key steps in this is definitely collaborating with other industry organizations, and they try to enlarge the business community knowledge and understanding of this complete new technology. One of the key being uh, blockchain uh, and IoT committee that we have under AIM Global's umbrella. They've been doing some fantastic work in tracking and tracing uh, technologies and what is new in that technology. They bring in uh, new ideas, case studies, um, trial solutions, pilot studies. So there is a lot of material that is brought forward by industry experts. They're discussed and we try to implement them in real life as well as educate about the results that happened in implementation. What I really enjoyed was last year when we had a normal, it was not like this. In one of our trade shows in 2019, we were doing a live implementation of tracking and tracing of a new technology and how the data capture was happening live at RFID Journal Live. So it really showed the entire process. So I found that really cool and educational. Even I come from an RFID background, but there is so much more to learn about data metrics and other technologies. So it was really informational for us. So I see that as a huge positive, thanks to all the member participation and the industry experts that we have. Great, thank you, Debs. Another question we received is, do you think EPCIS can bring meaning to the blockchain? So I appreciate that question, Isabel. Uh, and also there are a couple others along the blockchain vein that have popped up. So. Uh, obviously, uh, any good data platform can bring meaning to blockchain. Uh, again, one of the things around AIM is we're agnostic. Um, so whether it's EPCIS or a private, uh, private network, uh, the whole thing about blockchain is it's on the internet and you can access it if you have the right key. Uh, and that is meaningful. And, and as far as what kind of blockchain platforms are most re relevant in the supply chain, uh, there are many applicable ones uh, that, that do that. And again, we're not parochial. Uh, we're our work group. Uh, and Harish asked the question, how do you join? If you're a member of AIM, uh, you're free to, to join our work groups. Um, and those work groups look in and focus on those technologies or applications. So coming down to the answer about what, what, blockchain technology, or let's be clear, it's distributed ledger, ledger technology, is most applicable to supply chain. I'm gonna say it depends. And so what we need to do as a community is come to our best suggestions and recommend them. And that's what our groups do. They develop the white papers, they look at the applications, they contribute to the standards development process um, so that our user communities, our stakeholders, can do what's best for them. And again, things like blockchain, even barcodes and RFID, one size does not fit all. Uh, and if you don't mind, Mike, I'm gonna go on to the Internet of Things question um, that Joel asked. Uh, you know, the biggest challenge to the adoption of Internet of Things, um, I'm gonna call it multifold, right? There's not just one challenge. Uh, one, uh, we have everybody calling everything Internet of Things. Uh, true to some degree, really it is about uh, identifying the thing and then getting that information into either a local network, you know, and we call that sometimes an internet, right? It's an internet network of, of product or the global world wide web, 
which is what everybody thinks of as the internet, and then accessing the data. There are multiple standards working uh, on interoperability, on semantics, on those kind of standards. But I'm gonna tell you the number one thing is identifying the thing that is connected to the network. Uh, as you know, most things are inanimate. So our technologies, automatic identification technologies, whether it's a barcode, RFID, some other kind of sensor device that we have uh, is the key to IoT technology adoption and promotion. And that's why we've been very active since the very beginning of the Internet of Things. And in fact, uh, the term Internet of Things was coined many, many years ago in the RFID lab at MIT um, in talking about how RFID would enable things to be identified and be used in an internet of things. So uh, those are, are, are huge things that are going on. Great, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I wanted to go back to Harish's initial uh, comment, uh, and he asked once again, how can we participate and contribute in the blockchain work group? And I know he's actually reached out to me. So he's actually on that active roster. Uh, we're going to be having a meeting uh, within our IoT on blockchain here this April. Uh, you're going to receive more information on that because you are now part of that roster. But anyone who is an AIM member who's interested in one of our work groups, if you just want to contact me, that's mike at aimglobal.org, or just use the general email that we'll have later on in another slide. That's the info at aimglobal.org email. Just say which group you're interested in participating in, and uh, I'll get that information and make sure you're set up on the roster. Mike, I would like to take Isabel's question about using about uh, you know RFID uh, technology. I think the question was what about the frequencies around the world using RFID, EBC Gen two uh, V two. So we are aware that uh, just to give a brief uh, overview that RFID works uh, is categorized based on the op operating frequency, right? So we've got low frequency, high frequency, and ultra high frequency, which is UHF. Uh, EPC Gen 2 V2 falls under UHF uh, uh, band. And we are aware that uh, the UHF Gen 2 standard uses 860 to 960 megahertz, depending on the region of the world we are currently in. We are working uh, RAIN systems, most of RAIN RFID systems, more commonly known as UHF RFID is mm, in most country operates between 900 to 915 megahertz and we are working on a harmonization and mm, RAIN RFID Alliance is working very hard to bring in harmonization worldwide of this standard. Great, thank you, Debs. Uh, Chuck, what about anti-counterfeiting in the supply chain? You know, that's really an excellent question. Uh, and again, uh, when we talk about anti-counterfeiting, our technologies are key to helping mitigate that. Uh, unfortunately, the bad guys are always trying to think ahead of us um, and, and insert counterfeits into the supply chain, either in the packaging process or in the manufacturing process. So uh, by using things whether it's a digital watermark, uh, embedded uh, RFID tags, uh, passive RFID tags, RAIN technology, active tags or Bluetooth beacons, our technologies are key to helping prevent as much as possible anti-counterfeiting in the supply chain. And again, in concert then, our technologies with blockchain uh, help authenticate the thing at point of origin all the way through the chain validating its existence, again, with hopefully some anti-tamper technologies that, that enable you at the end to determine that you got what you were supposed to have got and enable the blockchain to work more efficiently. So, and again, whether it's, uh, again, Robin asked about digital watermarks, that's an excellent technology because it's pseudo invisible uh, or totally invisible to, to humans, uh, but there are other technologies as well. So again, we try not to be technology specific. We're gonna say that a technology uh, is applicable. It's, we, you, each user has to figure out what's applicable to their specific need. Uh, and, but AIM is here to promote all of it and give good information to our users and stakeholders about the application of our technologies 
and to standardize so that it's easier to use and implement. I mean, I just wanted to add another point because um, uh, the blockchain technology is something new and I am learning and AIM has been doing excellent work in educating people in that scope. And what I see is moving forward, all of these technologies, watermarking, uh, digital watermarking being one of them, would have to merge together to give us the best solution moving forward. So collaboration and working together in order to create standards and an advocacy of those standards is how we I see moving forward. So this is a perspective from someone who is completely new to blockchain and what I listen from all the work group and the activity that is being done. So definitely I would recommend uh, people new to this scope to join AIM, to reach out to my Chuck and actively participate. There is a lot of new information out there. And as a startup company or as someone really new in this technology, it gives you a voice. So the voice is needed. We need to understand more industry challenges in order to discuss that in our work group and also solve them for you. I mean, just a comment as a newbie into this technology. Thank you, Debs. Uh, another question uh, with uh, regards to the blockchain. Uh, do you see AIM working on a public blockchain ledger to be a catalyst for industry adoption? So I'll tackle that one. Um, if no one else is working on one, we would consider it. It would have to come again, as we talked about the process, up through one of our work groups, like our blockchain work group. Uh, I think one of the challenges is the cost of an operation operating um, a public blockchain ledger. I mean, you still need to have processors and, and data storage, right? Even if you put it out on the, uh, in the cloud, uh, there are still costs uh, associated with that. Uh, but AIM will do what's in the best interest of, of our stakeholder community, especially when they leverage our technologies. Debs, do you have an idea? Uh, at the moment, no, there were certain discussions about, I think it is a need-based uh, requirement. The effort to have in the public blockchain is quite significant. And if the momentum is pushed to the right direction, I do see AIM having one. But it is this constant discussion about how many industry players are ready to work on this. And also in the future, maintain it. Once we have it, which is open, it's also a point of maintenance. So we need to have a dedicated effort. This is something I would see we would move forward, but I don't think so the momentum has reached if we don't have the current momentum at the moment. Great, thank you guys for your insights there. Another question we have is, can you share some information on how RFID is being used in hospitals? What adoption rate are you seeing in hospitals and are there work groups focused in this area? Uh, I can take this question. So yes, RFID is being used significantly in uh, hospitals, both UHF as well as NFC. In many of the cases, they are, they are working in combination with one another. Uh, the applications range from patient tracking, wherein the patient is tracked from an operation table back to the room, or uh, tracking wilds, so different kind of uh, blood work that is moving around, uh, equipment tracking, uh, tracking of um, important, uh, so in an operation theater, tracking of tools. So I think their applications are multifold and they are all working either to in, in conjunction with other applications as an IoT infrastructure or just UHF, RFID, or NFC. Uh, we had recently, so AIM North America had recently published a paper which focused on tracking of COVID vaccine and how AIDC technology is being used. So that might be a good read up. So you can look into how different technologies are working in that sphere and developing and transparent supply chain for easier tracking of uh, vaccine. So we have got a pharmaceutical work group that works on this, but at the moment we do not have a larger healthcare work group. But if there is a need, there has been some discussions within the AIM North America board recently about focusing on a larger healthcare work group that really focuses on applications and discusses case studies in that scope. Uh, Chuck, anything else to add on that? So 
Uh, and again, uh, we have a sister organization called RAIN, uh, VA, uh, it's an alliance focused around passive UHF RFID, uh, enabling uh, good usage of the technology um, and industry adoption. Uh, and they have quite a bit of information and they'll have, uh, uh, this is where I'm gonna promote Engage again. Uh, <laughs> we can May, first week of May, AIM and RAIN will be hosting Engage again. Um, and you'll see lots of interesting use cases around uh, AIM technologies, the auto, full suite of auto medical indication technologies, as well as specifically on passive UHF RFID. In particular, I think healthcare is gonna be one of the key uh, focus areas. You know, and, and as far as adoption, uh, we're seeing adoption, but it's not uh, as pervasive as let's say in the retail environment. So we all need to work together to, to embrace the technology and help our user community uh, use this technology effectively. As Deb said, whether you're tracking surgical instruments in the operating room, to patients uh, through the operating theater, uh, to the vaccines, um, you know, digressing away from passive RFID, AIM and GS1 uh, worked on uh, a barcode um, application identifier to help decode uh, the temperature sensors, uh, temperature tags uh, on an offline basis, uh, particularly for vaccines that might go to a third world where they would not have connectivity. So uh, again, we're all about healthcare. We know that that's key to uh, our community. Uh, we want everybody to be safe and healthy. And I think uh, Rain RFID has a dedicated healthcare work group that's pretty active for, in a lot of aspects as well. Great, thank you. Another question we received is, what about the role of the assets, uh, GRAI, and the goods, SSCCs, uh, in the supply chain? So uh, those things you referenced are, are part of the GS1 uh, suite, let's call it. Uh, excellent applications of automatic identification technology. Um, and there's a lot of work going on within GS1. Um, and again, they're in liaison with AIM and talking about the, the role of the GARI and the SSCC in the supply chain. SSCCs have been used in the supply chain for a long, 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 long time. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's really the cardinal, if you will, the shipping uh, container identification information. Uh, and the asset uh, GARI is the asset information. Uh, and again, they're working on things, including something called digital link, which helps uh, leverage all of these things together uh, to give you more information. And of course, uh, we know that GS1 uh, through EPCIS and whatever um, are gonna be also instrumental in the blockchain for the supply chain, because when we think about supply chain, it's mostly focused around retail and it's gonna come through the warehousing environment all the way from the the manufacture of the goods all the way through the warehousing, all the way into the end user community, uh, primarily retail. Whereas uh, our other technologies enable uh, more, a lot of more industrial usage and, and consumer engagement. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Great. Another question uh, for uh, Debs. Uh, how do consumers of AIDC to technology in particular benefit from AIM's work? Uh, uh, is it the end users, right, consumers? Yeah. Yeah. So as an end user, uh, you are out there scouting uh, the technology. You have heard new ideas and you want to know more about it. So AIM is the right stop for you. So as an end user, the first benefit we get, provide our end users is information and knowledge. We have got a panel of industry experts working on case studies, educational materials, webinars, podcasts. So everything is apt, accurate, as well as to the current uh, scenarios. So that's a huge advantage for user community. One of the challenges that I have faced or I have seen user community faces is really they do not know which way to move forward, whether we need to work with this technology, that, or in 
adjacent with each other. So there is a lot of confusion and hence the slow rate of adoption. So AIM helps not only regionally, but as well as globally to make sure the information is readily accessible. It is simple to understand. There are trainings available. So that really benefits the user community. Apart from that, we have got a business directory that has a list of suppliers, vendors, leaders in the market, and the services they offer. So it, you know you can trust the source, you can reach out to them and ask about what to do next, how to move forward for their uh, projects. We also have the possibility online. Um, just log on to AIM Global or AIM North America way and you can submit your queries and ask us any question uh, that is uh, pertaining, that is your pain point right now, that how should we implement this technology? How should we work on that? And definitely, I mean, joining the work groups is what I always encourage, what I keep telling everyone, please join AIM, participate in the work group, the information exchange in work groups as a live meeting, the opportunity to network, the opportunity to know new people, the opportunity of listening to other pain point and you feel, you know, this is what is happening in the industry and this is where we need to move forward. And that is, I feel, key to um, solving your current challenges. I mean, in the scope of RFID, I'm just bringing this, we hear a lot of um, integration and application in retail, as Chuck mentioned earlier, the rate of adoption is massive and we see various applications. But now as other verticals are moving forward, they are following that footsteps. So the people who actively participated in retail work groups or solutions provided there were able to adapt that and work faster in other groups as well. Another advantage I see for end users is working with the government itself. You have a voice, you can let them know through the work group, through the comments sent to FDA and other organizations that where exactly is your pain point and how would you like this implementation to be done? We provide you a voice, which is very vital uh, for us as an organization. And I'm sure as a government organization, they would love to know what your pain points are. So yes, active participation and just the possibility to network, have an active participation, have the right knowledge, uh, being accessible to industry experts is what I would summarize as one some of the benefits for the end users. Great, thank you, Debs. Uh, Chuck, um, another question we received is, what is the division of labor between AIM Global and the individual AIM organizations in other countries? Yeah, so AIM Global is about uh, those issues that affect all users in, in the world. We have regional and country-based uh, chapters that are focused on more local issues. For example, uh, North America was worried about, uh, worried, uh, working with the, the FDA on the UDI, Unique Device Identification Standard, as well as, for example, uh, the UID, Unique Item Identification Standard, uh, which was primarily in North America. It, they are both going global, but they started here in North America. So they focus on local issues. We do have some regional entities. For example, we have an AIM Europe, uh, which is uh, made up of the chapters in Europe plus AIM Global to have a direct liaison with the AIM, uh, with the EU community. So again, the division of labor is really uh, progressing from where most of our members are at a local country level, uh, then to the region level, whether it's Asia or Europe, and then uh, global issues. And one of the other things we like to do um, is help harmonize things across the world. For example, Debs talked about uh, the EPC Gen 2 V2 frequency issue. Uh, AIM, uh, in collaboration with RAIN and GS1, have been working the issue to get the 915, 900 to 915 band harmonized worldwide so that only one uh, reader is needed worldwide. Uh, we're having some sticking points in Europe, but we've been very successful in getting it promoted and adopted in a, in a majority of countries. Uh, so those global issues, which enable global usage of our technologies are the keys for AIM Global. Um, and the other part is where we can take information from one chapter and one uh, local organization and help promote it to, 
to the other uh, users in the other countries. Uh, and then again, things like the technical symbology committee, the RFID experts group, those are more global issues. And that's where the global effort uh, is focused. Great, thanks, Chuck. Um, another question we received is uh, basically, what is the um, major benefits of collaborating with like-minded organizations on AIDC education and standards? So uh, we, that, that's why we have lots and lots of liaisons. We want to be the unbiased, right? And we are uh, totally unbiased. And you look at my answers to all the questions like, yeah, no, then we are not gonna prefer one over another. Uh, but we're about promoting our technologies and the appropriate use of our technologies, whether it's an end user uh, application or in a nation uh, on how they're gonna apply the standards or the frequencies, for example. Um, the goal of AIM is to be totally unbiased. Um, and in doing so, uh, you know, we're gonna promote education advocacy and networking to accomplish that so that all of our stakeholders have a voice um, and that we do give an unbiased view of, of, of working with that, not only to the people that are members, but other stakeholders who may not be members of AIM. And again, those are the other organizations like the Industrial Internet Consortium. We, we have a liaison relationship with them, uh, with others. And, and I see a question about OPCUA, uh, which, uh, and again, I'm not as fluent in that one, but that has uh, been originated up out of our German chapter. Uh, they're working with the OPC Foundation to have a machine language interface with what the work of AIM is doing. And again, as it comes out of Germany into Europe, it'll come into the global community. So that's what we do. We're, we're all about collaboration. Our job is to give good information out there so that everybody can use our technologies effectively to help themselves, in particular our end user community. Great, thanks Chuck. And uh, going along with that, uh, can you just give a brief overview of AIM's role in ISO standards? Again, uh, AIM as a liaison into the ISO community has a strong voice. Um, in fact, many of our members within AIM are very active in, you know, through either their own country or through AIM uh, in developing ISO standards. Uh, as I mentioned, almost every barcode uh, symbology in use that has been standardized has come through AIM's technical symbology committee and gone into the, uh, what's known as SC31, which is the International Standards Organization uh, and IEC uh, Joint Technical Committee for Barcode and RFID Standards. So uh, AIM can also, uh, and because of our liaison status, if we have something that we believe in, we can promote it directly into ISO without going through country, uh, the country process. And we did that, for example, with 29160, which is the RFID emblem uh, that came right out of AIM and we put it directly into the ISO community. So again, uh, our job is to give good, global, unbiased information and, and input, uh, particularly on standards. So um, that is how we work in the international standards community. Great, thank you. And it looks like we've answered uh, most of the questions. I've been holding off on this question uh, for a moment, but I'll, I'll ask Debs this right now to conclude. Uh, and this question is, I just joined AIM, was the best way for my organization to get the most out of membership? Um, first of all, I mentioned this earlier as well, join the work group, participate actively, bring forth ideas, collaborate with industry partners, develop policies and standards. I just cannot stress enough on the activity that happens there, the kind of networking, and it is of tremendous help for anyone who joins. So I see that as the biggest first step, you know, that that is a must. And just do not focus on just your work group. 
try to listen in to as many work groups as possible. That gives valuable information. You know what is happening in verti other verticals, and that is really helpful. Uh, we offer the opportunity to have market record, uh, market reports available. Please access those market reports. We work with one of industry's best uh, market reports provider. We have recently worked with Rain RFID and provided the report of uh, how the state of Rain RFID is overall. Please use these reports, engage with new partners, open the horizon and look into what new partnerships entail. Uh, what I see is what is beneficial when you enter AIM, you come from a certain vertical or a certain technology. So in my case, it was RFID. But when I joined AIM, I realized that if you want to bring transparency and traceability to your items, the only way moving forward is working with different organizations, working with different technologies globally. And that is something that I would encourage every company joining, learn, educate yourself, understand the different technologies, find the commonality and work forward from there. Other offerings that we have is talk to your team and try to host a webinar for us. Talk about your product and how it's making an impact in the space of transparency and traceability. What's new? Educate our community. It's an exchange of information platform. So once you bring forward, other people would join in and add to your, um, to your information. And that is critical moving forward. Share your case studies. In many of the cases, we, we find very informational, uh, case, informative case studies already available that is done by the organization. Please bring that forward. We would love to share them on our platforms. We are very active on social media. We would do everything to promote the technology you are working on. Uh, we have also recently launched something called the Product Showcase, where we feature on different uh, products uh, that are being developed in the industry. So it's kind of a digital, uh, you know, it's a newsletter that comes out, shows what are the applications, talks about the case study. I find that extremely valuable. So please participate actively in all of these different ideas. And above all, if there is any other way we you think we could help you with, please come forward, talk to Mike, talk to Mary Lou, talk me. We, we are more than happy to listen to that and make sure we bring maximum value to your membership. Thank you, Debs, well said. Uh, once again, Chalk Debs, really appreciate your time today and insights. Thanks for all the attendees who came and listened to us. Thank you. And I'm hoping to work with all of you. So I think the next step should be send Mike an email. Yep. So I do have uh, Chalks and Debs emails up right now. If you have a specific question for them, you can reach out to them uh, here. I'll leave that up just for a second for everyone to take note. This is also being recorded so you can go back to the uh, webinar at any time and review some of the questions we answered or, you know, find contact information as well. Also, here's the AIM contact, that's info at aimglobal.org. Please reach out to us if you'd like to, you know, talk a little bit more about AIM and our initiatives, and uh, we can give you all the information that you need. Uh, thanks again uh, to the audience for their active participation today. We really appreciate it. And uh, once again, Chuck Debs, can't thank you enough for all the information you provided today. Really appreciate it. You're glad welcome. to do it and glad to be part of AIM. Same Thanks, here. everyone. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.